Welcome to the Windsor Essex County Health Unit's media briefing for Thursday, February the 3rd. We are joined today with Nicole Dupuy, Dr. Shankar Nasathuri, and our manager of epidemiology, Ramsey D'Souza. Uh, we will start the briefing today with some opening remarks from Nicole, and then we'll move into our epidemiology summary. Go ahead, Nicole. Okay. Uh, good morning, and thank you for joining us today. In light of the change in restrictions under the Reopening Ontario Act, we wanted to take a few minutes to discuss COVID-19 prevention protocols for businesses and workplaces. Uh, last weekend, the health unit worked with our provincial partners um, in the multi-ministry enforcement and the multi-ministry enforcement team to conduct a high volume of inspections across our region. Uh, you may recall that the health unit has coordinated a number of similar blitzes in the past to align with the emergence of uh, new regulations and changes. Across the businesses who were inspected, there were a number of similar concerns, um, concerns we've noted previously related to previous inspections. Since a number of these restrictions have been in place for many, many months and continue to be in place, I wanted to share uh, the following information for businesses. All workplaces are required to have a COVID-19 safety plan in place which should be visible to patrons and easily accessed by all staff. This plan should be reviewed regularly with staff and all staff should be aware of its contents. Secondly, businesses which are accessed by the public are required to have specific signage in place. These include the capacity limit of the workplace and signs for public health guidelines, such as maintaining physical distance, wearing masks and not entering the business um, if you are ill or experience, experiencing any symptoms. These signs should be clearly visible to all patrons upon entering, uh, such as at the front door or immediately at the entrance. And examples of the signs can be downloaded and printed off of the workplace section of the health unit's COVID-19 webpage. Third, all employees must do a symptom screening prior to starting their shift. Screening should be reported to their manager and anyone with symptoms is, um, should not be attending work. It's important to note that some of these items, such as the safety plan and symptom screening, will need to be reviewed and updated regularly to reflect any changes um, made by the Ministry of Health. And I believe the workplace uh, screening tool through the Ministry of Health online uh, was just updated this week. These will ensure that current guidance is being followed to help our community uh, stay healthy. And if you have questions about the current restrictions or what should be included in your workplace safety plan, certainly you can call us at the health unit or visit our restrictions page of our website at wechu.org. Uh, we recognize the challenges faced by businesses in the community over the course of the last few years, and we really do thank you for your hard work of owners and operators for all they've done to follow the regulations and keep our community safe. We just encourage, you know, at this time, you know, we do really need to continue to follow those basic measures that are outlined and certainly will continue to be out there along with our um, enforcement partners to educate um, and enforce uh, as we move into uh, reopening. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. We will move over to our epidemiology summary now with Ramsey D'Souza. Thank you, Ashley. So hi, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to this week's epi summary. The, the flavor of this week's epi summary will be more geared towards vaccines and what, where the region is currently with our vaccination status and progress. So let's begin. So this slide looks at our vaccination history since the first dose was administered locally in Windsor Essex. Um, the, the blue bars uh, indicate our first doses that were primarily administered um, in, in the spring, followed by the green bars, which were in, in, in the summer of 2021, and currently the orange bars, which, uh, which is currently ongoing with our booster doses. Um, as you can see, there are peaks in terms of where our, our doses were, were administered. Currently, though, um, we are seeing a decrease in dose administration in, in, in Windsor Essex. <clears throat> so, so this graph is just a, a zoom in of where we were since the beginning of December until the end of January. Uh, most recently in the last seven days, uh, approximately 600 individuals received their first dose um, and, and just under 2000 residents received their second dose. So, there's, so we are seeing individuals receive and complete their primary dose series. Whereas in the past seven days, uh, just under 5,500 individuals completed um, or received their, their third dose. When we look at our vaccination status by age group, um, 
we we do have high coverage rates and rates in, 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 in most of our age groups. However, there is some is still some work to be made primarily in a five to 11 age group. Overall, our, our coverage uh, in, in the region for all residents, including those who are not eligible, is sits at 81.7%. This graph looks at the cumulative coverage rate since the beginning of time whenever a group has been eligible to receive the vaccine. Um, in some areas, you can see that it's it's, it's been saturated, uh, specifically in the older age groups and even those um, uh, 30 years and older. However, if you look at the, 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 the light blue line, um, at the bottom right, which which is our five to eleven age group, we are seeing a plateau in terms of the uptake of our first doses. When we look at our fully vaccinated coverage um, for for second doses, it does tell us a similar story as well. We are seeing higher coverage rates in some of our older age groups. There is still some progress to be made um, in a in a twelve to twenty nine age group, um, and we're just beginning. Uh, to administer second doses to our 5 to 11 age group, so that will change uh, over, over the next couple of weeks. Similarly, uh, in terms of looking at the trend, um, looking at the light blue line at the bottom right, we are seeing uh, an increase and a spike in terms of second doses being administered to that age group, uh, and, and hopefully that, that, uh, that trend will, will continue over the next few weeks. Now, when we look specifically at boosters, um, boosters are, are currently only eligible for those 18 plus, um, and there, there is still some some progress to be made in, in this age group. Overall, uh, for those that are eligible, the 18 plus age group, we, we currently sit at 51.2%. Uh, we, we are seeing um, a gradient of, of coverage across the age groups. Uh, the 80 plus has a higher coverage rate at, at 82%. Uh, whereas in terms of the younger age groups, specifically the 18 to 29, uh, the coverage is just just, uh, just below 30%. And once again, if when we look at when we, when we do look at our coverage rates um, over time for our, our our third doses, we are we're also starting to see that it is plateauing as well. So what does the breakdown look like across uh, across our region for for first doses? We are seeing um, some variation within our community, specifically in the NOP postal code, the NAT postal code, the N9A and the N8X postal codes, uh, where our coverage rates could be higher, um, but are currently below either our hotspot um, coverage rates um, or or the overall coverage rates for our region. Those same postal codes follow the same trend in what we're with in terms of what we're observing with our second doses as well. Uh, there is still some progress to be made um, in terms of improving our, our overall coverage rates in, in those specific geographical areas. Now, how does Windsor Essex compare to other areas of the province for first doses? When we look at those who are eligible, eligible to receive a first dose, so those five plus, Windsor Essex currently sits at the, the bottom half of the province in terms of coverage rates and also below what the overall coverage rate is of the province. We're currently just below uh, or close to 86%, whereas the province is at 89%. That same trend also follows and holds true when we, when we look at our fully vaccinated coverage uh, for for second doses here. Um, we're also in the bottom half in terms of where we are in the province uh, and the province currently in terms of their second dose coverage rate is at 84 uh, percent. However, though, our coverage rates in if you're looking at the southwest region, specifically our neighbors, we do have a, a higher coverage rate compared to those in, in Sarnia Lambton and in Chatham Kent. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ramsey. Uh, Dr. Nessathuri, did you have any comments you would like to add? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, um, uh, colleagues in the media. And uh, uh, we wanted to emphasize something at the Public Health Service, which we think is really important. And we hope to get this message out. There are, um, uh, when we look at the people dying of COVID currently, and I was just speaking to a colleague at uh, uh, the Windsor Hospital uh, last night, there are really two large groups of people dying. One are um, unvaccinated people, and uh, a number of those deaths are people in the prime of their life. Um, and many of those deaths are really senseless uh, and are preventable. 
Another, the other group of people that are dying of COVID are people with chronic medical conditions who are vaccinated. So um, people who are vaccinated, the, who are dying are, 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 are individuals with chronic medical conditions. Um, and that's a community that uh, I really want us to reach out to today. So my ask is that if you uh, have a kidney transplant or a liver transplant or a heart transplant, or you know someone who has those serious uh, procedures in the past, to really get vaccinated with that booster. It, it will make a difference. It'll be uh, uh, something that'll positively effectuate your health. And so um, the other community that uh, we wanna really try to reach out to get their boosters are those people uh, who've had previous cancer treatment, uh, uh, um, uh, that chemotherapy, radiation treatment, People that are eligible for the boosters should get the boosters, but particularly those individuals who have uh, chronic medical conditions. And we particularly want to alert people who had previous transplants and cancer in the past to get their boosters as soon as possible if they're eligible. So uh, uh, that would be our core message today. And I hope that's a message that we can convey to the community overall. Thank you very much. We will move into questions from the media now, starting with Blackburn. Oh, good. My mic is on. Okay, good. Uh, I wanted to ask Nicole the results of the blitz over the weekend. Do you have uh, any idea how many businesses were were uh, visited and how many were warned and if any charges were laid? So 100. 11 businesses were inspected um, during the blitz. 47 were issued warnings and four tickets. Okay. And many of the warnings were related to the items that we, um, you know, I, I mentioned. So again, around uh, PPE use um, and uh, the screening and safety plan. All right. Now, these are rules that have been in place for now just about two years. What did they say about why they're kind of lax on this? Um, I, that would be a, a good, uh, I don't have the... Uh, anecdotes about uh, what, um, you know, what people are saying, that'd be a good question probably for our inspection team. But, um, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, I have heard over time, similar to other things that, um, you know, they weren't aware of the rules or um, weren't aware. I know we've heard and we've mentioned this before as well um, with with restaurants in particular or, or uh, places wherever you're going to be coming, a worker's going to be coming to contact with um, within two meters with someone who's unmasked. Um, there is a requirement to wear uh, both eye protection and a face mask. And, um, you know, over time that has caused some confusion. We, as a health unit, I know have talked about that and, and sent out memos just to um, workplaces specifically to make sure that they are, you know, aware of what the actual rules are that apply to them. Um, so that would probably be the, the the biggest reason we've heard is that they weren't aware. So um, again, uh, we, you know, appreciate the media and helping us get that message out. Our officers are obviously out and part of that is education. And, um, and then we do work with our uh, BIAs and our chambers and um, to also share information um, and ministry, other ministries such as Ministry of Labor, just to make sure that everybody is aware of what their requirements are. Thank you. Um, Ramsey, I got a question for you too in regards to the EPA summary. I just quickly looked over the uh, package that was sent out to media and it looked like all the indicators with the exception of deaths were down this week. So I guess, what does that tell you? Does that tell you that the burden of illness is easing off? Um, it's it's mixed right now because we are seeing um, decrease in, in, in hospitalizations and even though our RIC numbers have remained fairly stable, um, you know, we, we we are also concerned with the number of individuals who are dying. And I think the message today, you know, with terms of what, what Dr. Um, uh, Nessiter was saying is that is to get your booster dose if you are in those vulnerable populations as well. So it's it's mixed um, in terms of where what we're seeing. Uh, there are some positive signs there, but uh, there is still some work to do for, for, for our community. Thank you very much. Yeah, if I could just supplement that. Um, um, in January, 53 people uh, died of COVID. Uh, in December, it was 27. I'm just looking at my notes here. And uh, in November, it was seven. So the, the, uh, 
the burden of disease as if death is the end point uh, is still significant. Um, that I think the number of hospital, people currently occupying hospital beds in Ramsey can correct me is around 60. So that's, uh, 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 I think that's about 10% uh, of the hospital capacity in the health district are uh, occupied by people who um, um, uh, are being treated for COVID. The current, and I think that num that's number of 60 is lower than it was in previous weeks. The metrics that we have now are in part a function of the public health restrictions that we had for the many weeks previously. And so what we need to do moving forward is to monitor what the burden of disease in the community will be uh, after we've had these relaxations on Monday. The first signals I think that we will start seeing is, uh, 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 is sometime uh, this weekend and going into next week. And um, I think that it's important for us to monitor what the effects of these relaxations are and, and to be sure that uh, if there is an increased burden of illness that we have the sufficient resources in the hospital system uh, to manage that increased burden. The other point I think is worth thinking about, and this is not a, a, uh, an item for today or tomorrow, but uh, I, I think in these next few months is um, how do we shift to normalizing COVID as part of our culture and community? Um, COVID's not going away or it's not likely to go away because we've had it for two years. And so then we have to think about what are the suite of approaches that we can do as a culture to learn to manage and live with COVID. And in medicine, there are very few cures. Uh, we try to palliate illness on an individual level. And I think this is really a shift from, um, uh, for us, the shift is gonna be when we move forward, is we're going to have to accept that some things are going to change for the near and intermediate term. And among them, it's likely that we'll probably have to wear masks uh, 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 indoors, at least for the uh, uh, short and immediate term. Um, that we're probably going to require annual booster programs or semi-annual booster programs of vaccine, just like we do for influenza. That we're going to still have to maintain some component of social distancing. Restaurant dining won't be as carefree as it was previously. Travel is likely to be uh, more challenging. But I think we have to uh, uh, we have to find sufficient hospital resources um, to care for the people who might get sick, and recognize that the level of public health measures may be modulated by the burden of disease. Um, it's entirely possible that we may have other variants beyond Omicron. They may have different characteristics related to infectivity uh, and uh, hospital utilization. So I think that as we move forward, we need to have a fulsome dialogue with our society and the community and how we can normalize uh, COVID-19 um, uh, moving forward. I'm sorry for that long-winded comment, but uh, uh, I hope that provides additional context. It does. Thank you very much. Any questions from the Windsor Star? Yes, good morning. Doctor, just regarding your conversation with uh, the hospital physician, are we seeing that individuals who are dying with chronic conditions have not had their third dose? Um, I think that a better, uh, a better understanding is many of the people who are uh, uh, chronically ill do get their vaccines and they do get their, they, they do come up to date. It's the nature of having chronic illness that makes you more susceptible uh, to, to uh, experiencing the adverse outcomes of COVID. In general, people that are up to date on their vaccination and are otherwise healthy are not likely to be hospitalized or suffer significantly from the most adverse effects of COVID. The vaccinated people who experience the adverse effect, the adverse effects of COVID, meaning the people who are vaccinated. Um, who have chronic medical conditions, they're more, they're more likely to go to the hospital and be hospitalized. And they're a community that we should do everything we can to protect. You know, a kidney transplant is really one of the, one of the greatest successes in medicine. When it works, it gets a person off dialysis and it can work for a long time. 
Um, um, people in transplant are on immune suppressive medications many times, and uh, their health status is more fragile. So to the extent that uh, we can encourage people who have uh, chronic medical conditions to get their boosters, which have only recently become available to them, uh, is a core message. And separately, we're seeing in Ramsey's presentation that uh, the 5 to 11 age group uh, is really lagging behind when it comes to vaccine coverage. Doctor, what is your message to parents about why they should uh, seek vaccination for their children, considering uh, the youngest of our population are not the ones experiencing the most severe health outcomes? Well, I think that uh, at one level, um, 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 when we vaccinate somebody, the individual benefits to the extent that they're not likely to have the most severe outcomes from uh, COVID. COVID. Uh, it, is, it is true that most uh, children who get COVID will recover on, and have an uneventful course. But there are uh, a, a few children who do suffer adversely. Like a lot of vaccine programs, getting vaccinated is just not for the person getting vaccinated, but for the community overall. It is part of our collective affirmation of looking after other people. And uh, uh, when one vaccinates their child, they're also helping break the chain of transmission. Child, COVID infecting a child to a parent to a grandparent and perhaps make him way on that way on to a, a nursing home or a long-term care facility or retirement home. Um, so I think that uh, vaccinating your children for COVID is a good thing. It benefits the child, but it also benefits uh, uh, other members of the community. Uh, and it's one incremental step in keeping schools open. It contributes to uh, allowing us to keep schools open for instruction. Thank you. Any questions from AM 800? If, if, if I can just add on the 5 to 11 point as well, um, just uh, we do have the information. I know we've promoted it before, but certainly we would encourage any parents who maybe um, have questions and want to discuss the vaccine further to you know, reach out to their primary care provider. Um, but also Sick Kids does have a wonderful service. Um, I believe it was launched in October when we first talked about it. Um, it, it. You can find that information on our website and it is uh, you know, a toll free, free number. Um, it has trained medical um, staff um, and is an opportunity for parents to call and have their questions answered or any reservations or concerns they may have um, you know, related to vaccinating their children. It, it, you know, I would encourage folks to take, uh, th take that opportunity and um, you know, make sure they're getting their information um, from a, you know, a trusted and, and expert source. Um, so that would just be the only other, you know, message we'd want to want to get out there that there are some great tools uh, for parents and understandable that parents, you know, want to do the best for their children and may have concerns. And, uh, you know, so to reach out to those individuals that um, either know your child best or have an expertise in, in um, you know, pediatric medicine through sick kids and, and take advantage of those tools. Thank you. Uh, any questions from AM 800? Nicole, just going back to Adele's question in regards to uh, last weekend, are these repeat uh, offenders that the health unit and the inspectors are seeing? Um, I can't speak to the specific sites, but yeah, we do see some um, where, you know, we have um, some, some businesses that uh, are, you know, quote unquote, repeat offenders where uh, we've gone um, back related to complaints um, usually, and I think I've said this before, um, you know, when we do follow up or if we issue a warning or a ticket, um, you know, our team does go back. Um, and so we will uh, follow up. And I, I failed to mention from the blip, you know, there are at least 40 or 45 businesses, you know, that we, those that received alert warnings, um, they are, you know, they will receive a follow-up to make sure that they have, um, you know, addressed whatever was, um, you know, part of that warning or, or um, education. And at that time, if they don't follow up with the education <laughs> that they were provided, would that mean they could face uh, uh, fines or be ticketed? Right. So the fines are described under the Reopening Ontario Act. Um, there is a schedule of fines. And so, uh, you know, they, they 
will be ticketed. Yeah, if they haven't corrected, um, you know, the enforcement officers will um, will likely, uh, you know, will ticket. Um, it is in the hands of the, and not just our enforcement officers, by law, police, whoever it is that is um, out there. Um, but yeah, the next step, certainly after any education or, or a warning, um, would be a ticket. And um, and then there's you know uh, different levels of those tickets and then certainly um, uh, you know longer court, there's a court process around those. Thank you. Just one question in regards to uh, the vaccines. Uh, I think this is probably for Nicole. Um, obviously, there's three mass vaccination clinics open in Windsor Essex. A lot of resources go into those with your team, Windsor Regional. I know city staff and county staff have assisted. I'm not sure if they're still assisting. But if the numbers keep on decreasing, will the health unit and I guess Windsor Regional look at these sites and maybe say it's not work, not, not the right word to use it, maybe not uh, keeping them up and running because those resources could be used for other, for example, health unit programs? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, uh we do. You're right. We have a number of sites right now, as you as you all know. Um, at one point in the summer, when we were doing first and second doses for the majority of the population, I think we had five sites. Maybe at one point, um, we whittled that down to one. Many communities actually had completely closed their mass vaccination sites, and um, with the you know um, urgency to uh, get boosters in arms of, of every, every adult in our community, um, we ramped those back up. So now we have. Um, three, we continue at Sears with Windsor Regional, and we're grateful for their partnership and support. Um, as well, uh, you know, we have the county site and um, the one in the West End operated uh, mainly by Hotel Du Grace. Um, we are communicating and talking with our partners right now about what does the, you know, what's the end date for those sites. And um, we'll probably look to a slow uh, ramp down. Um, you know, uh, mass vaccination sites obviously aren't um, sustainable for forever. And so we are um, having those discussions regularly about redeploying uh, staff back to programs that need them, whether it's through the hospital or our own health unit services. Um, and um, so, so you'll hear more about that certainly as we uh, work on our plans and we consider what might a wind down look like. Um, and then our strategy will shift as it had in the past um, to focusing more on the, those mobile outreach efforts, um, you know, to continue to get out into the community and make sure that uh, vaccines are available and accessible to those who still have not, you know, received their first, second or third. Thank you. Any questions from CTV? Yes, good morning. Would the health unit consider adding restrictions if the death rate doesn't decrease or is the fo focus more going to be on continuing to encourage vaccination and boosters? Um, could you repeat the question? I think you'd, uh, if you had asked, uh, perhaps you could repeat it. I didn't get the first part of the question. Sure, no problem. Um, I was just asking if the health unit would consider adding restrictions um, because of the restrictions that have been loosened, would, would the health unit add restrictions if um, certain indicators like the, the, the number of deaths, the death rate in the community doesn't decrease, or is the focus more on going to be encouraging continued vaccination and boosters? Well, at the current time, I think the focus is uh, on encouraging vaccine uh, and, uh, uh, and particularly on booster doses, but also on people who have not started vaccine to get into uh, uh, their first and second doses as well. Um, the public health service is governed by the Health Protection and Promotion Act, and uh, uh, that statute uh, 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 requires health units to consider um, the local circumstances, and uh, uh, it does have uh, uh, provisions for uh, additional uh, measures if, if they're appropriate. I think at this point, uh, we continue to monitor the situation and leave all the options open as the statute had contemplated. Um, I think moving forward, the real issue right now is to monitor what the burden of disease in the community is uh, subsequent to these relaxations. Um, and based on that information, we can try to formulate the best possible public health plan. Uh, our colleagues at the provincial level, I'm sure, are doing the exact same thing, which is they're monitoring and seeing what the effects of these relaxations are 
recognizing that uh, we always have to balance different risks versus benefits. Um, so I think at, at this point, we're just gonna continue to monitor and keep all the options open and all the tools that might be available to the public health service to manage the pandemic. Okay, thank you. And do you have the breakdown? I believe on Monday, um, it was released that there were 84 deaths since November, 40 fully vaccinated, 44 either unvaccinated or partially vaccinated. Do you also have the number of those people who received their booster shots? Do we have those data? Oh, sorry, Nicole, I spoke over you. Go ahead. Um, yeah, we can look at that. Um, if it's a small number, we won't. We wouldn't provide it, but we can look at that number and um, and provide that. Okay, thank and, you. Um, and sorry, go ahead. I don't know. I was just going to say on that point, if in, I was going to say, Dr. Nisthuri may want to add, but um, we may provide in the email just a little bit of, um, you know, with that information being careful how it's interpreted. So again, I know we shared um, the total number of deaths and the number who are vaccinated versus unvaccinated. And, um, but just being mindful that, you know, for the number of individuals who are uh, unvaccinated, it's a much smaller population, although they're a much larger proportion of individuals that are um, dying from, from COVID-19 or, or related to COVID-19. So we'll add that in our response as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Ramsey, just a quick question for you. I know there are several factors, but does it appear that the region has passed the peak of Omicron? Um, I think that, that that's a bit challenging to to say. I, you know, since the testing changes that ha that have happened um, as of December 31st of last year, we have since then seen a decrease uh, week over week in terms of our case counts and and our incidence rates. So, um, you know, and that also involves a, 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 a specific group of high risk individuals as well. So, but our wastewater data, though we don't have it for this week, has indicated that it has been going down. But I, you know, just going back to what. Um, Dr. Nessitori um, uh, uh, was saying, with the reopening, we, there is a lot of uh, possibility that we could see an increase too. There was also some data released by the, the by the province's um, science table as well, indicating that uh, we could see an increase as well based on various scenarios. So we will have to continue monitoring to see what the impact may have been in our community um, over the course of the next couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah, if I could follow up too, there's a, a wonderful slide in the, the science table slide deck, which basically indicates that uh, the, um, there's a wide range of possibilities of the burden of disease moving forward. And it graphically captures based on certain assumptions that we could have significantly more cases or significantly less cases in the hospital. Um, uh, so uh, in the absence of having uh, robust individual level testing data, we'll have to work on that estimate, that broad estimate moving forward. Thank you. Any questions from CBC? Yes, good morning. Um, we are seeing the number of active high case, uh, high risk cases dropping steadily. Um, what would need to happen or how low would that number go to reinstate more robust contact tracing or do you think that's a thing of the past now? Well, the, it's always difficult to predict the future, but the, uh, I think the province has for now uh, suspended uh, uh, most case and contact uh, uh, tracing programs and uh, shifted to a focus on congregate settings where people share bathrooms and kitchens and live multiple people live in uh, uh, in the same bedrooms or sleep in the same rooms. Um, I think the one caveat is is that I don't believe you could we could really use the number of positive cases as a clear metric of burden of disease because we're not testing. Uh, uh, a significant number of people who have COVID. And so uh, I think we're left to use other metrics, which I think are uh, imperfect, but uh, I, I think give us reasonable inferences. And that is 
hospital admissions or hospital, current people currently hospitalized, people currently in the ICU, the number of people on the ventilator, uh, uh, and the wastewater data. And those are the data elements that I would use moving forward. Um, uh, uh, you know, the pandemic of one thing we know is that's unpredictable. It's not inconceivable that we may move back to individual level case and contact management, but at least for now, the provincial direction is to move away from that, and uh, uh, we will, uh, you know, monitor the situation, make our judgments moving forward. Thank you. Any? Okay. Uh, and oh, oh, sorry. Can I have a follow up? Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, would you like to see any wider testing resume once the case numbers get down? Like, would you like to see that return as a metric to uh, the burden of disease in the community? Yes, if, uh, if we have the resources, uh, um, um, testing, uh, uh, identifying and testing people if we have the resources would be an, uh, helpful in the management of the pandemic. And if there is sufficient resources to do this moving forward, uh, I think that's something that uh, the public health service uh, at Windsor Aspects would welcome. Uh, the challenge at this point is, is that uh, uh, there's not sufficient resources to test all the people that we would like to, and therefore we have to prioritize testing based on uh, some framework. Thank you. Thank you. Any follow-up questions from Blackburn? I'm good, thank you. Uh, follow-up questions from Windsor Star? No, thank you. Uh, from AM800? Sorry, just a quick one. Uh, I'm guessing this is for Nicole again. Nicole, for uh, the QR codes, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but if an, uh, uh, someone from the States comes to uh, Windsor Essex, comes to Ontario, um, and they want to go to the, the ring to watch a family member's hockey game or go to a restaurant. How do they get into those uh, establishments if they don't have a QR code? So we don't dictate that. Um, that would be up to the um, establishment. Um, but yeah, they're not entered or would have a QR code. So, uh, you know, I would expect they would be using their, um, you know, proof that they don't live here. Um, and and show their valid proof of um, of uh, full vaccination. And to be honest, then it would be up to uh, the individual business or institution to verify that and create a system and a policy around around that. There may be something. Um, I know there's some updates around the QR code that came out provincially, and so there may be um, you know further updates in that regard um, within the provincial guidance documents. Um, Although I'd have to check with our team on that. Although I see Eric's on, he may have the answer. But generally speaking, um, you're right. They wouldn't have a QR code. And uh, I think they're, you know, that will be a challenge to some degree, certainly for us being a border town. And, and there are visitors uh, frequently. But, um, um, you know, each institution and business would have to create a plan for how they manage that. Thank you. Any follow-up questions from CTV? No, no thank you. Uh, follow-up questions from CBC? No, thank you. All right, thank you very much, everyone. That concludes our briefing for today. Uh, we will meet again on Monday, February the 7th. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.